at the service today at the Washington National Cathedral, the president mixed in words of resolve and national determination with words of condolences and mourning. Ed Bradley, you have some information on what's been happening in Europe today. Tell us about it. Well, there's a moment of coming together to share the grief with uh, those of us here in the United States, a moment of silence across Europe from east to west. Some of our former Cold War adversaries, people stopping in the street for a moment of silence. In London at 11 o'clock, traffic came to a halt. The only thing you could hear was the, the big sound, the sound of the chimes of, uh, of Big Ben. The tube stopped running. Queen Elizabeth was at St. Paul's Cathedral with Prime Minister Tony Blair leading the mourners there. In Paris at the same hour, uh, traffic came to a halt. The underground, their subway, which is called the Metro, stopped running. Uh, the, you could hear the bells of Notre Dame Cathedral. And in Berlin, uh, 200,000 people gathered at uh, what's known as the Brandenburg Gate, uh, where the Berlin Wall used to be, also in a moment of silence. As far west in Europe as uh, Ireland, businesses, pubs closed for the day in solidarity with this day of remembrance and prayer here in the United States. Well, that's heartening, and one doesn't say that offhand. There's every indication this is going to be a long struggle, a long war, and it'll be interesting to see whether those feelings expressed with such sincerity today have staying power. We're going to go down back to Washington, Jim Stewart. Uh, Jim, uh, let me caught my eye at the bottom of one of these Associated Press reports. The Associated Press quotes what it says is a, uh, a government official suggesting, and I quote, that we haven't seen the end of the current threat, speaking on condition of anonymity. This government person cited what he called concerns that the terrorists may strike in a different manner now that the airport security has been improved. What's that all about? Dan, I don't, if they have knowledge of a specific threat against a specific target, they, they certainly aren't sharing it with the news media. They, they have, though, talked quite openly about uh, the manner in which Osama bin Laden has gone to school on us every time he conducts an attack against U.S. interest. Uh, if we, when he attacks the U.S. embassies and then we put up uh, jersey barriers, if you will, and protective glass in our embassies, he checks that out and he, he tests that security. When he attacks with aircraft, as he did on Tuesday, I'm sure he's taken good note, or his people have, rather, of the uh, extra security on the aircraft and at the airports. It would only make tactical sense that if he intended another target within the United States, he would go where we are not, as opposed to where we are, Dan. You know, keeping in mind during the Vietnam War, uh, a, a guerrilla war, if you will, <clears throat> a guerrilla war of a, while it, a, with a big difference from what we're going through now, but this is, in effect, a guerrilla war in the shadows. And with guerrilla fighters, it's axiomatic that when the enemy is strong, you retreat. Uh, when the enemy gets strung out, you harass. And when the enemy is weak or sleeping, you attack. <coughs> And that may be worth keeping in mind as we enter this war, this new war, what President Bush has called the first world war of the 21st century, the war on terrorism. I want to go back to, well, for the first time today, actually, to our chief Washington correspondent, Bob Schieffer. Bob? Uh, good morning, Dan. Well, Dan, when the president gets to New York uh, today, he's going to have some good news for New Yorkers in the sense that he'll be able to tell them that both houses of Congress have approved this emergency aid package. It will be $20 billion to start what everybody here is calling a Marshall Plan to rebuild New York. In addition to that, there will be $20 billion to track down and prosecute this war against the terrorists. It was one of those strange, weird little things that almost never happens here, happened here this morning. The Senate votes the old-fashioned way. Senators walk in, uh, they cast their vote, aye or nay, uh, and it's written down. But in the House, uh, they vote by uh, electronic computer. Each member of the House has a, a card. He sticks it in a little slot, and a computer registers his vote. Well, the Senate passed all this unanimously, 96 to nothing, uh, 
on the economic package, 98 to nothing on a war powers resolution. But the House, in the midst of its electronic voting, uh, 190 members had cast their vote when the computer broke down. Now, it only takes 218 to have a majority. So all of them, uh, most of them went to the memorial service today. They all had to come back after the memorial service, and now they're voting uh, manually, as it were. This is all just uh, part of the atmosphere. They would have done this at one time or another. But at any case, it will get done by the time the president gets to New York, and he'll be able to make that announcement to New Yorkers. Bob Schieffer on Capitol Hill. Let's go live to our London bureau and one of the world's most experienced foreign correspondents, Richard Roth. Richard, uh, you've been monitoring uh, events in Afghanistan. If that strikes our viewers as strange, London is an ideal listening post uh, for what's happening in uh, Afghanistan and, and, for that matter, throughout the subcontinent. Uh, what are you hearing there? Dan, uh, reports from Kabul, Afghanistan today speak of fear and a new flood of would-be refugees who are desperate to leave the Afghan capital, worried that the military might of the West may soon be aimed at them. Most of what people have heard in the Afghan capital has come from foreign radio broadcasts and word of mouth. Television is banned under Taliban rule. Most international telephone lines are down. This is the Muslim holy day. Few shops and businesses are open. But in a place where invasion and civil war have claimed so many lives in recent decades, and where drought and poverty have added to the hardship, there is now worry the misery may get worse. The reason, of course, is the Taliban leadership that's harbored Osama bin Laden. Taliban society is strictly controlled and governed by its own brand of Sharia, Islamic law. Some Afghans say they're hostages themselves to a regime that came to power promising to restore order, but has done so with brutality. Public executions are part of the routine of ordinary life. A French photographer last month, working with great discretion in a place where photography is not welcomed, came upon a hanging in a public square. The man, the Taliban said, was a terrorist. Those who came to witness were matter of fact. They'd seen this before. At a soccer stadium, it was a woman brought in with a group in the back of a truck who met her death. Officials said she'd been convicted of killing her husband. This is the society that's given shelter to bin Laden. The wealthy Saudi exile runs his own training camps in Afghanistan, youths being taught to fight the West. And these pictures are from what's come to be described as his organization's recruitment video. Taliban officials have condemned Tuesday's attacks on the U.S., but they claim bin Laden wasn't involved and they refused to give him up. In fact, the Taliban spiritual leader today was quoted in a radio broadcast as telling Afghans to stay patient and steadfast, to face, in his words, any American attack with courage and self-respect. Dan? Richard Roth live in our Washington bureau. And if you've just watched and listened to that report and saying to yourself, that's harsh stuff for television. War, to say the least, is harsh. And it's no good kidding ourselves about what the nature of our opponents and potential opponents and enemies may be, want to clearly underscore here that while much has been said in the last few days indicating that action against not just Osama bin Laden but against the ruling powers in Afghanistan may be inevitable, we do not yet know that that's going to happen. We go to Russ Mitchell who's near the main missing persons location here in New York. Russ, good day. D Dan, this time yesterday, the scene at the Manhattan Armory building behind me was one of chaos as thousands of folks lined the block to get inside and file a missing persons report. Today, I can tell you, things have calmed down considerably. There are a few people here, but nothing at all like we've seen the past few days. New York City officials tell us in the past two and a half days, some 4,500 people have come here to file missing persons reports. When people go in, what happens is they're given a seven or eight page questionnaire about their loved ones. They are then taken to a counselor. Then they are shown a list of some 2,000 names of people who are either in area hospitals or were treated at area hospitals. Police trying to put names with some faces of people who at this point may still not be identified. I want to bring a young lady in that we talked to 24 hours ago. This standing next to me, this person standing next to me is Layla Negron. Now, Layla's husband worked in the World Trade Center on the 88th floor. When we spoke to you yesterday, 
You said you were still very optimistic. It has been 24 hours. How do you feel now? I'm still optimistic, still. I mean, it, he can be in a little air pocket just waiting for somebody to pull him out. That's, that's, I pray to God every single minute of every day that that's what he's gonna do for me and my two children. Have you heard any news at all about your husband? Yes, um, I spoke to a woman that was taken out of the rubble, um, not out of the rubble, she was out of the building. Um, my husband went to her and told her that he needed to get out of the building and she was supposed to follow him, but they kind of split up. She got out, but she didn't see him. She said five minutes after she was out, the building collapsed. But she knows for sure that he did leave the office. He did leave the office. Yes. As I talk to people today, I am struck by how optimistic everyone, including yourself, still is. Let me ask you, what keeps you going? What keeps you this optimistic? 